morning. Happy Sabbath. I don't know if you, any of you noticed my, uh, my tie this morning. Did, did anybody happen to notice that? Um, if you haven't gotten a close-up look, um, it is uh, a tie that has lighthouses on it. And I just have to share a quick story concerning that and how the Holy Spirit works because um, as Pastor Matthew mentioned last week, we had a minister's retreat here in early January. And uh, one of the things that uh, we did for a little fun, you know, because pastors have to have fun too, right? And, and we can get pretty crazy because, you know, when you're when you're facing stress all the time, you need a stress reliever, and the only way to do that is to go big or go home and get crazy. And uh, that's what we did as pastors. We just got crazy with one another. And so we, uh, we all were challenged to bring to the retreat a crazy tie of some sort. And... Uh, so I had to find one in our dress-up box uh, for last week for Pastor Matthew. We, we have these, we call them our nerdy clothes. And um, so that's where Pastor Matthew's tie came from last week. And he gave me this one. I didn't think it was really that bad. I said, cool. I said, he, he was kind of like, what? I said, yeah, this is cool. I said, because my next sermon when I'll be preaching and wearing this is on being the light of the world. I said, that is perfect. <laughs> he was like, oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. So if you thought maybe I was, you know, just not being in style because my wife is, is absent, uh, no, that's not the case. But she is. She, uh, thank you for praying for my daughter. Speaking of prayer, thank you for praying for my daughter, uh, who is pregnant and uh, has been suffering with horrible, horrible morning sickness to the point to where mom had to come in and care for her and our little grandson. And the good news is they're back in Washington. Uh, my daughter, within this last week, um, actually the morning sickness has subsided. She actually has an appetite and even cravings for food now and uh, her appointment with her midwife went well and so I just want to thank you as well for prayers for for them and uh, tomorrow uh, my wife will be coming back from Washington uh, the Lord gave us another gift I didn't have to drive all the way over there Terry and Margie Thomas are there and they're bringing her back so uh, we're grateful for that so pray for safe travels and hopefully God willing she will be here next Sabbath. Amen. I know she's been absent for some time. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad you're excited. I'm going to be doubly excited. And uh, it's kind of funny sometimes as a pastor, you get strange looks when your wife isn't coming to church. <laughs> yeah. But there was a reason. Well, as we begin, let's go ahead and have an added word of prayer this morning. Oh, Father God, thank you so much for uh, all that you do for us. Thank you for inviting us to be here with you today. Thank you for giving us your word that is a light unto our feet and a light or a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Today, Lord, help again illuminate our path. Um, and may we walk in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know, are my slides not coming up on the monitor? Okay, here they come, I think, hopefully. Uh, um, I need to, uh, before we go on, I want to uh, apologize to some of our families who have children that uh, are, are looking forward to uh, taking some Bible studies and uh, preparing for baptism. I promised an email and just didn't get that out this week, um, but I will be contacting you this week, and hopefully we can start our studies uh, next Sabbath. So I'll give you those details a little bit later. So um, 
please take the order of service sheet out of your bulletin. Do you have a bulletin there? Has the order of service sheet in there? And turn it over to the other side and let your eyes kind of gaze down at the bottom of that page. And on the bottom of that page, on the left-hand side, what do you notice? What is it? A mission statement. Now, whose mission statement is that? It's ours, right? It's our mission statement. It's the Caldwell Church's mission statement. In fact, when I first came here to uh, interview for this position uh, here at this church, this mission statement was in place, and this was very instrumental in me accepting the call to this church. I had one that was very similar, personal, and I've shared it with uh, a number of churches that they seem to adopt the same thing. And my, my personal one was to know God's love, to grow in God's love, that I might show God's love. But our mission statement here is very similar. The Caldwell, or the mission, I want you to read this with me. The mission of the Caldwell Church is to what? Experience God's end time message of love and to do what? So it's twofold, isn't it? It starts with experiencing. Do you know why? Because you can't give away something you don't have right? You first have to experience it, and once you experience it, then you can share it. Share it. Now, to share this love, where we need to be? We need to be in the community. You can't share it with anybody if you don't have people around it to share it with. Right? So we have to purposely make a move and go into the community and to share it. And this is exactly what Jesus is stating when he says to his disciples in Matthew 5.13, he says, you are the what? The salt, of the, the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything, but except to be thrown out and trampled by man. Now, as we saw in our last study, Christ has sent the disciples in to the world. We're, we're not to be of the world, right? But we need to be in the world because Jesus, again, has called us to be salt. And as we found in our last study, salt is primarily a preservative. And how they would preserve the fish of the day to get from the seacoast to, to the market is that they would take the fish and they rub, would rub it down with salt. We learn to be able to do, have any effect on the people in our community. We need to rub shoulders with them. Right? You can't do it from a distance. You have to get intimate with them. And Jesus is saying to us today, you are the salt of this earth. You're the salt of this community. Because the community, the world, is rotting. It's rotting. It is spiritually dead. You don't preserve something that's living. You don't take a live fish and smear it down with salt. It's a dead fish. And the world today is dead. But I want to turn now to Matthew chapter 5 and verses 14 to 16. Because of all we do as Christians is retard, you know, or to, to, to delay the or prolong the I should say to delay the rotting process, right? If that's all we're, we were doing, we're, all we're doing is prolonging the suffering in this world. 
How many want to prolong suffering? You want to do that? I don't either. But God says, hey, I want you to go out. I want you to be a presence in this world, to bring some goodness in this world, that, to preserve the world so that you can turn around and be... Hmm, what does it say? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it where? Under a bowl. No, instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, Jesus says, let your what? Your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and then do what? Praise your Father in heaven. So just as the word salt implies that the world is rotting, the word light implies that the world is lost in darkness. The world is lost in darkness. Would you agree that metaphorically that the world is lost in darkness today? In fact, I think the world is infatuated with darkness and death. You see the portrayals of death, violence, intolerance depicted everywhere. Clothing, right? Clothing, decals. Media, you know, you see skulls and violence depicted almost everywhere. There's an infatuation with it. The world's infatuated with it. Second Timothy chapter 3 describes the world this way. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money boastful, proud, abusive. Do you see that today? Are we, do we see that today? Disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful. Unholy. Without love. Unforgiving. Slanderous. Without self-control. Brutal. Not lovers of the good. Treacherous, rash, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Do we see that today in our world? Do we have to go very far to see it? You see it in your neighborhood? How many school shootings do we have to have? How many mass shootings in public places do we have to have? And yet, the world doesn't feel a need for God. They seem to be moving even further away from Him. Verse 5 says, having a form of godliness, but what? Denying its power. Have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to do what? Acknowledge the truth. What Christ is saying here is that the world has denied the gospel. The good news about our salvation in Christ. In Christ, we have died to sin. Sin no longer has any power over us. But wait, there's more. Because although we have died in Christ, we have also been given new life in Christ. We've been raised up in Christ. We've been given new life in Christ. We've been made spir spiritually alive in Christ. That we might once again reveal the glory of God. 
his loving character. That's who we were created to be. When Adam was originally created, he was created in the image of God that he might show the glory of God. In other words, that he would manifest that character of God of love and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. But when Adam plummeted the world into sin, it died spiritually. And now we see the evil deeds of darkness that are taking place all around us. And this is what Paul is saying when he says they have a form of godliness. In other words, in our humanness, we, we, we have this vessel. We have this form of godliness. We try to think more highly of ourselves. But, but for that light to shine, just like that glow stick, with that, to get that light to shine, there has to be what? The glory of God within us. The Holy Spirit. Right? Paul says humanity. No, they, they have a form of godliness, but they're denying the power that's been given back to us in Christ. So in this context, Christ is saying to us, you Christians, you are the light of the world. Go take the light of truth into the darkness because I love my children. I don't want anyone to perish. The question is, do we share the heart of God? Or are we going to extinguish the glory of God by hiding it in our humanity. Are we going to live for self? Or as love would have us to live for the salvation of others? Look, I get it. It's a cold, dark world out there, right? I would rather be in the comforts of my own home I would rather be here this morning with you in the comforts of this building with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who sh are like-minded, who share something that I have in common than to go out into the highways and the byways of the world. But God says, I want you to go. And as you go, I will go with you. I will go with you. Again, friends, I want you to come here and enjoy the fellowship of believers. I want you to meet in one another's homes and enjoy that like-mindedness as you go to go in prayer with one another or as you just even do community together. Those are good things. But those people out there who aren't like-minded, they still are our brothers and our sisters. These are our children, God's children. I can't imagine any one of us here getting a call and finding out that one of our loved ones has been in a horrible accident and been rushed to the hospital and whose life is in the balance that we would feel comfortable saying, okay, I'll be there in a while when Pastor Lou finishes. Click. Would you do that? None of us would. 
we would immediately excuse ourselves, get up and go to the side of our loved one. People are perishing for a lack of truth about Jesus Christ, the salvation that's in him, and the love of our Heavenly Father. We can't afford not to go. Let's go back to Matthew 5, 14, where Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Just as he said in the, in the previous verse where he said, um, you are, are to be salt. The word you in the original language in the Greek is plural. You all. You as a group. The salt that represented the goodness, the righteousness of God. So although we are many as Christians, right? God is in us. And therefore, his righteousness is with us and can be seen. Likewise, you all, all of us, corporately, many of us, there's many, but there's only one light. There's only one light. Christ is saying, you are many, but you're one light. What is he trying to tell us? Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 3. Arise, shine, for your what? Your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. So this light is synonymous with God's what? His glory. Arise, shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory, what? Appears over you. His banner over us, scripture tells us, is what? Is love. Nations will come to your light and your king's and, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. This is the pro a prophecy concerning the first coming of, of Christ. Let's, let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse, beginning with verse 76. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. This is a prophecy, again, speaking of Christ. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. Uh, I'm sorry, this is for John. John is prophesying of John. Zacharias gets this prophecy of his son, John. You will be a child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare what? The way for him. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. So again, the angel is saying, look, the Messiah is coming. But people need to be prepared for his coming. So you are sent to be a messenger. You're to go out and give people of the knowledge of salvation that is coming. That they might be saved, that their sins might be forgiven. Verse 78, because of the tender mercy of our God. Why, why is God willing to save humanity? Why is Christ coming? Because he has, he has mercy and by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our, our feet into the path of what? Peace. Christ came to this world to save sinners of which I am the worst. I'm the chief of sinners. Isn't that what Paul says? He came into the world. He left the comforts of heaven to come to this dark world. He came to be light to the world that is living in darkness as to bring them peace. John 1 says, in him was life. This is speaking now of Jesus. In him was life, and that life was the what? Light of men. 
The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness hasn't understood it. No. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. So that through him, all men might what? Believe. He himself, that is John, was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to how many? Everyone. He was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not what? Recognize him. He came to that which was his own. In other words, even Israel, Israel were, they're constantly focused. When is the Messiah coming? When is the Messiah coming? And even though he came, his own people didn't even know it. They didn't receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them right to be what? Children of God. Mm. Please notice that Jesus came into this world to bring life. Because life, our life, without him is condemned. It belongs to the grave. And that life, that eternal life Jesus came to bring is the light of humanity, the light of men. John 8, 12 says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the what? I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Again, whoever follows me will never walk in what? Darkness. Never walk in darkness. But have the light of life. Therefore, for us to be the light of the world, we first must what? If you want to be the light of the world, what do you have to have? You have to have that light. You have to have Jesus in the light. You need to be born again. You need to open your heart and allow the Holy Spirit of God to come in you. Right? If this is new to you, uh, please ask me after the service to share more with you. I'd be more than happy to do that. Romans 8, 11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also do what? He'll give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who lives in you. Now, he's not talking about, I mean, people out in the world who don't, who don't claim to be Christians, who, who don't uh, have Jesus in their life, they're still living. By all appearances, from outward expression, they're still living. So he's not saying, hey, if you become a Christian, hey, you can just go and, you know, live life. What difference is that than what's happening in the world? No, he's talking about a certain type of life. He's talking about life that's filled with the spirit of the living God. Again, back in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp, put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, you are to let your light shine before men, that they may see your good what? Your good deeds. And praise who? Your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying that God has not given you the Holy Spirit to dwell in you so that you can hide him. He's taking this metaphor and he is saying that the whole world needs to know that you are a Christian. Whether at work, whether you're at school, whether you're in public place, whether you're at home, wherever you might find yourself, you are to live a life that glorifies your Father in heaven. To 
people see Christ in you? Do they see the peace of God which passes human understanding in your times of crisis? Do they see the love and compassion that, that, that causes you to love even those who are in opposition to you? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 14, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my what? Now we need to understand, because on one hand, Pastor, you're telling me, hey, you are to go out and, and mingle with the world. You're to rub shoulders with them. And now you turn around and you're sharing a text where Jesus says, hey, don't be yoked together with them. You know what a yoke is? A yoke is something that they used to use that they would put on what we call beasts of burdens. Maybe it was an ox. And they would yoke that ox with another ox. So there would be a, one ox, a mature ox, that would be taking a young ox who might be more independent and would show him the way. And they were yoked together. So as one would lead them, the other one would have to follow. Jesus, don't be yoked with the world. But remember, he said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my, my yoke upon you. You see, as Christians, we have a different yoke. It's not a matter of saying, hey, I'm going to de-yoke myself. Go cholesterol free. It's not that type of yoke. No. Jesus comes and releases us from the yoke of the world and puts his yoke upon us. And we live now in freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from death. Freedom, freedom from the ways of the world. Jesus says, don't, don't call yourself a Christian and live like the world. Don't take that form of godly set that candle that i've lit don't put it under a bushel basket don't snuff out the light of heaven don't hide it they need you they need to see me jesus said in you God wants to walk in us so that the world can see him. Jesus said, let your light shine. Well, how do we let Christ who dwells inside of us shine? How did Jesus reveal the Father? John 14, 8 says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen who? The Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it's the Father, what? Living in me. Who is doing the work? Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on what? The evidence of the miracles themselves. What was the greatest evidence that Jesus gave that he was the Messiah? It was his works without favoritism. He worked miracles among the Jews and the Gentiles. 
It wasn't just miracles of acts of healing and so forth. It was the supernatural act of love shown for all people, regardless of their creed, regardless of their race, or their, their, their race regardless of, of their uh, gender. Regardless of how they saw themselves, he ministered and loved the good, the bad, the ugly. Don't get me wrong when I say this. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. One of the greatest ministries we probably have in this church that is ongoing has been our community service center. Where we give away clothing and we give away food to those who are in need. But let me ask you a question. Are there public food banks? Where do you think a lot of that food comes from? The world. It comes from the world. The clothing that's given, much of that clothing comes from our community. We're just recycling. How is that, if we're going to rely completely on that, how are we any different? What are we doing that is so magnificent, so supernatural, that they say, wow, those Christians really got something. Now please remember, don't hear what I'm not saying. I still believe Jesus is working through that community service center. And there are many people who are sacrificing their time and their, their, their funds and other things to see that ministry continue. But what else are we doing? What supernatural things are we doing when we look at what Jesus did I believe in the last days God's going to pour out his spirit upon his people and they will do miraculous things are we preparing ourselves for that this next Wednesday we're starting up our prayer meeting again And we're going to focus on prayer. We'll share a little bit of devotion here and there because we're going to have to ease ourselves into this because we're not used to praying fervently. I believe that God wants us to open ourselves up to him to a point that supernatural Holy Spirit power is going to come upon us. And I believe once again, before Jesus comes, there's going to be healings. There's going to be lives that are steeped in sin that are going to be changed and transformed, not by diabetes undone, although that's a good program, but I believe by the word of God. People who are a bondage to addiction, or who plagued by, by maybe spiritual forces that are speaking things to their heads, hearing those voices, I believe God wants to deliver them, and he can. But friends, I can't be a vessel used by him if I'm not opening myself up and preparing myself to be fully, fully willing to be filled by him. Christ did these miracles. Then you find in the book of, you find in the Gospels here, where in the book of the Gospels you have the miraculous powers of God and the love and character of God being revealed in one man. Right? But then you go to the book of Acts. Jesus has gone back to heaven. 
And now you have many men and women who've now been given the gift of the Holy Spirit who are now doing the works of God, who did miraculous things, who opened the eyes of blind, who called the, the lame to get up and walk, who delivered people from demonic powers, even raised the dead. Now that was short-lived because the world crept back into the church jealousies and fighting, infighting, division. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even what? Greater things than these, because why? He's going to the Father. Why should we do greater works than Jesus? What is he talking about here? He says, because when I go, I tell you the truth, it's for your good that I'm going away. Because unless I go, who will not be able to come? The counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. See, remember, when Jesus came to this world, he gave up something. He gave up a lot. But he took on humanity. He took the form of humanity. He can't be of himself everywhere. And so he said, though I'm not going to leave you comfortless, I'm going to the heaven, into heaven, so that I might send the Holy Spirit. And he will be in you, right? And do great things. I'm almost finished here. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and, Ju and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And friends, let me say something. It wasn't that they were just going to go out and they were going to preach sermons. The first miraculous thing that happened when the Holy Spirit came on them is they all began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. This caught the attention of people all around them. It's like, well, wait, aren't these all Galileans? A supernatural power, a miracle, so to speak, but for only one purpose. So that the gospel might be given to people who were within their presence. Yes, a miracle, but not a miracle alone in the sense of a miracle of performing and speaking in many languages. The miracle of giving truth to the listeners about a Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. Mm. Again, God wants to lighten the earth with his glory, and he wants, you to, he wants to do it through you and through me. How can we lighten the earth? How can we do that? <clears throat> I think I skipped the slide here. I missed it. John 13, 34 and 35 says this. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not as the world loves. Not as the world loves. When he's talking about one another, he's not talking about the church being a clique, loving one another. He's talking about loving all as Christ has loved us. Friends, to do that, you have to go. do that we need to be mingling with the world to do that we need to be their friend someone who's trustworthy someone who they know is looking out in their best interest we don't have to look like the world in the sense act like them but we need to be in the world and we need to offer them something better. 
And they're going to resist at first. Many of them will continually resist. But they're going to put you and I to the test. Oh, yeah? I don't think I'm very lovable. Let's see how good your loving is. And they throw fits. And they become the most unlovable people that you can ever imagine. Will they see Christ in us? Or will we go back to our comfort zone in our homes and in our churches? Where we sit and wait for Jesus to come and be that servant that when Jesus comes, doesn't find them working. Lord, I took what you gave me and I buried it. I put it under that basket so nobody get it out. Not realizing that we smothered the very thing that he gave us to shine. Or will we be that servant who when the Lord comes, he will find us faithfully working for him, for the souls of this community. I'm raising a higher standard for myself and for this church. God can do miracles in you and in me. So please, let your light shine. God didn't put his spirit into us that we could hide him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, today we need men, women, children who are willing to open up their hearts to you to abide in you as it says in John 15 so that you can abide in us and the world can find truth and find salvation in Christ Jesus Please, Lord, help us in our experience of that end time message of love so that we truly have something to share with the people in our community and we can run into the darkness. In Jesus' name.
for your message of love. Thank you for your spirit that you've freely given to us. Lord, freely we have received, and now, Father, help us to run into that darkness to freely give. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.